ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening, a uh, warm welcome to all of you for our monthly lecture of today. A very special and a very warm welcome to our speaker of tonight, uh, uh, Professor Jerzy Przyban. Uh, Jerzy is actually our uh, um, um, uh, visiting fellow, Jan Patoczka visiting fellow at the moment for the month of uh, March and April. Uh, but not only that, in fact, he is a long-term colleague and friend of the Institute for Human Sciences. Just to mention one of his most recent merits, he was a contributor to uh, a very special issue of the Institute's journal Transit, namely the very last uh, issue, number 50, uh, that was dedicated to the legacy of 1989 and uh, a, a very special issue and you were one of the con contributors and we are still grateful to that. I also mentioned that because Klaus Nellen, uh, who edited uh, uh, Transit for many, many years, is also present, uh, a co-founder co of the Institute for Human Sciences. Um, our speaker of tonight, Jerzy Przyban, is an alumnus of the Law Faculty of Charles University in Prague where he obtained uh, his habilitation in 1997 and became a professor in 2002, specializing very much in the fields of the theory, sociology and philosophy of law. In 2001, uh, he joined uh, Cardiff Law School in Wales and works as a professor there since 2006. Today he is also the director of the center of, of its of its center of the university center of law and society. Not only to mention these technical details of his career, I think this moving from Prague to Cardiff also had a huge influence on the content of his works, on the topics that he is working on, and also on the uh, how to put it on the style, on the attitude on the way of presenting his thoughts. Um, I will give you a very nice example of that, I think, uh, soon. There is this very nice inter intermingling and this very nice encounter of uh, very special Czech and Welsh, I would call it, habits, um, that he combines masterly, but also at points very joyfully, and you can tell that he plays with it joyfully and playfully. Uh, next to being a professor, Jerzy Przyban is also a well-known essayist, author and translator, writing extensively in the areas of philosophy, of law and political science. He is a regular contributor for mainstream Czech media, just to mention Czech television, Hospodářsk Noviny, this is the economic newspaper, and Pravo. And also, maybe a, to a bit lesser degree, but also a contributor to uh, very many British uh, media. Instead of offering more factual knowledge to you now, I'd like to very much stress uh, the encounter with Jerzy Przyban, whom many of you who are guests and fellows of the Institute have already met over lunch, I suppose, uh, to outline his character as a person who is full of wit and irony, and this is more than an accidental quality of his, but as you will maybe also see a bit in his talk, also something that is precious to him as an intellectual value. Out of his very many publications, I will just very briefly mention three to you, um, dispersed over the course of years. 1999, Rule of Law in Central Europe. Uh, 2002, Dissidents of Law on the 1989 revolutions, legitimations, fictions of legality and contemporary vision, version of the social contract. And thirdly, 2007, legal symbolism on law, time and European identity. I think these three titles already give you some idea of his work that is centering around questions of constitutionalism, law, dissidence, um, um, coming back to these core issues. His latest book I have with me, I brought with me, The Defense of Constitutionalism, The Czech Question in Post-National Europe. Already the, sec the subtitle, The Czech Question in Post-National Europe, you note a slight contradiction there, gives you an idea of uh, 
uh, a double movement uh, or a double move that is very characteristic of his work, namely of widening particular questions to much broader, or one could also say international or universal contexts, but also reapplying universal theoretical setups to particular cases, in this case the Czech question, or at some parts of it even the Welsh question, if I may say so. It is very much a critique of what uh, Jerzy Przyban calls uh, political existentialism. Two main names uh, for his critique could be mentioned, Carl Schmitt and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I think they are in the center of his criticism. And uh, the que Czech question, the so-called Czech question, question, which uh, has a very long tradition, maybe not known to all of you, but it's a long debate starting in 19th century or maybe yeah, 19th century and has not left us since then. Um, it is not just his attempt to phrase this Czech question as an existential one, but as one of constitution and constitutionalism and a civilly strong democratic society. Less technical than it sounds, because it is not just a dry defense of constitutionalism and constitutional democracy, but more general of a pragmatic concept of democratic politics. The book has a shows a very personal uh, approach with a lot of references that only Jerzy Przyban, with his very special biography, can make. The last chapter, and I will end with this, the last chapter of this book is entitled Checking Wales, which has a nice double meaning, or in fact a double-double meaning, at least phonetically. What uh, he means is obviously not Wales, which one can maybe also observe on the coast of Wales, I'm not sure about that, <laughs> but he means uh, the country of Wales that is part of the United Kingdom. And the visible, invisible, hidden, miraculous, astonishing parallels that this small part, allow me to say so, of Great Britain has to his first home country, namely the Czech Republic. Historically, sociologically, artistically. He's also very interested in art. All the chapters have a reference to art in the very beginning. And all of that are very much uh, um, um, written against his personal background, the background of his personal biography, and against the background of a saying that I considered crucial for this book, namely a, a sentence by the German philosopher uh, Georg Simmel that he quotes, a stranger is not the one who comes today and leaves tomorrow, but the one who comes today and stays tomorrow. <laughs> I can just say, read it. Jerzy uh, uh, Przyban is very good at checking whales. Um, well, Jerzy Przyban decided to stay in Wales for quite some time now. He started in 2001, quite some time. So you perfectly fulfill uh, the uh, definition of Georg Simmel, uh, of who is a stranger. You are a stranger in Wales, maybe not any longer, who knows. But let's hope that he will also continue to stay uh, a bit in Vienna. Because, and this is my final, final sentence, because I think a friend uh, is not the one who comes, but the one who leaves and comes back. Jerzy, <laughs> please. Thank you very much, Ludger, for such a far too generous introduction and uh, 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 yeah, uh, quite uh, moving things that you said. Um, certainly, the book that you mentioned uh, uh, was praised uh, by a reviewer for the Slavic Review a couple of weeks ago even as sexually explicit. So I should probably qualify it because there is no sexually explicit content apart from my artist friend, uh, uh, Erika Bornova, who is a sculptor and uh, who uh, had a series about prostitution in Prague in the 90s and I did to compare it to uh, political situation. So um, I feel very privileged and uh, honored uh, to have this opportunity and to join this very special institution for a couple of months and um, during my stay I met uh, so many wonderful people 
and I had so many fascinating, original, exciting, inspiring conversations over lunch and, uh, and not just uh, uh, in cafeteria. And uh, I have to say that uh, I uh, met so many people who I dare to say are now my friends that uh, I hope that uh, I won't be a stranger in uh, Vienna and I will keep coming back. And uh, uh, it's uh, when I, on my arrival, you know, there is similarity between Prague and Vienna and flying from Cardiff, uh, uh, getting ready for Brexit, but yeah, you know, uh, Brexit never ending story and uh, uh, landing in Vienna and I said mm, uh, one feels almost like home and um, yes I feel like home here so um, when I was uh, now about the lecture when we were talking with Ludger and Klaus and um, other people what to prepare for today I thought it should be personal, but also it should be about legal theory, constitutionalism and uh, certain political legacy of uh, typical of Central Europe. So it should have Czech, Welsh, Austrian links. And clearly, if um, uh, you come to Vienna, you must mention Hans Kelsen. Hans Kelsen was one of the gigantic figures of um, uh, uh, 20th century legal scholar, the author of the Austrian constitution, constitutional judge, and uh, one of the most influential legal scholars. And uh, I will briefly talk about uh, him. He is about to have his monument built in uh, three different, two different places because he invented uh, so-called pure theory of law and uh, in Prague, because he was born in Prague, they want a monument, two pillars, one called Sein and the other called Zollen. But uh, now there is some problem because uh, his birthplace is on the site where the department store Mai is and the owners apparently don't want two pillars, only one. So they said that uh, Zollen should go to Vienna <laughs> and perhaps Wollen to Berkeley where he found his uh, refuge uh, as a refugee and uh, as we know uh, 20th century is the century of refugees and it still carries on so we are still in 20th century in many respects and my lecture will be a little bit about it. So because I am um, constitu uh, uh, um, uh, I'm working on a new book and uh, the working title is called Constitutional Imaginaries. And uh, usually when you say the Constitution, people associate it with particular images since the ancient times. Nomos, topos, ethnos. Territory, people, law. And uh, in modernity, this usually translates into one particular organization of the nation state. However, as we know, today we have laws, nomoi, that are global or European. We have topos, which cannot be limited by nation state. And we have peoples who are defined by many different characteristics, not just necessarily by the ethnic nationhood. I know that um, uh, talking about identities is a very tricky uh, subject and I don't want to go in that direction tonight, but uh, clearly overlapping identities that are supranational European, some people would call themselves even cosmopolitan. Um, but um, uh, preliminary conceptualizations are always about what is constitutionalization. The easiest answer is, um, is the process of transformation of power into authority. So constitution 
plays the role of legitimation of power and turning it into authority. Uh, coming, uh, my background is neither um, pure theory of law, legal normativism, uh, nor um, um, philosophy of uh, Jan Patočka, but uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm closer to social systems theory. And one of the um, uh, benefits of sociological method in legal science or in constitutionalism is that it uh, tells you uh, one important thing, that power is not just potestas, political power, authorized into auctoritas, but that there is societal power which precedes, which is independent, works independently of political system, and this societal power is uh, uh, called potentia, its potentiality, its capacity uh, in the most general sense, and it constitutes the relationship between society and um, political system. Law, ever since the ancient times, played an important role in legitimizing political power. Potestas led to imperium in the Roman law. There was imperial power. But at the same time, in ancient Rome, there were lawyers, and lawyers provided auctoritas. That's a very interesting aspect of the ancient Roman law, that law took care of auctoritas, and uh, um, uh, politicians, the emperor, took care. Uh, uh, care of auctoritas. Uh, in modern times, and this is part of my argument, even uh, um, what I want to outline uh, today is, however, if you want to understand the process of legitimation, you cannot exclude societal power, potentia, from uh, this process. You have to look beyond law, you have to look beyond politics, and you have to ask actually, what is background power of constitutionalization? What is it in society which drives us towards constitution making? What is um, uh, this um, uh, power which establishes meaning? And uh, Charles Taylor here, he came up with a famous, now famous book, uh, Modern Social Imaginaries. It's not imagination, nothing to do with uh, the sociological imagination, nothing to do with the legal imagination. It's something much more, uh, um, uh, it's, it's less ambitious theoretically and more important sociologically. Imaginaries are, as he says, the ways people imagine their social existence, and uh, it's a reservoir of the common understanding and a shared sense of legitimacy. And we can call it background power. So first, let me make an initial comment on um, the imaginary of democracy as uh, uh, in pure theory of law by, um, over there, but before I make this, you can start, and usually um, legal lectures are extremely abstract, general, and boring. And you can start from the abstraction, but uh, living in Britain for um, a long time enough, I will start with an example, or I will start from a literature. In 1922, Czech novelist uh, Karel Čapek wrote a dystopic novel called The Absolute at Large, uh, yeah, 1922. And it's about the invention of a reactor that, apart from producing cheap energy, produces the absolute as a byproduct. Okay? And what happens? If you produce something industrially, it turns people into agents of the good. However, the good comes in many different forms. And this leads, of course, to moral disaster and most horrible global war driven by nationalist and religious 
fundamentalists who want to fight for their good. And here is a wonderful quote uh, from uh, final pages of uh, uh, the novel. And uh, um, he says, well, <laughs> it's not God is great. He's too big. Yeah? He's infinite. It's almost like moaning about uh, characteristics of you know, deity. And that's what's causing all the trouble. Everyone measures him against his own size. Suppose that's all the God there is. And to convince themselves they've got all of God to themselves, they have to kill all the others. Karel Čapek um, uh, brought many things uh, to check uh, cultural and intellectual context. He translated French modern poetry. He introduced uh, American pragmatism uh, to check philosophical context. Uh, and uh, um, usually in Czech, if you say a prag he is a pragmatist, she is a pragmatist, uh, it's a derogatory word. But Karel Čapek um, uh, said, well, this is how we can coexist. And he was a truly convinced Democrat. He was almost like the cultural figure of the First Republic, the novelist, uh, closely, uh, close friend uh, with uh, uh, Tomáš Garik Masaryk, uh, um, uh, Czechoslovak president, uh, who is not particularly popular in Vienna, I understand, uh, but uh, he was a great figure um, in uh, shaping uh, uh, democratic uh, um, political culture, uh, which lasted only 20 years, and uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, and Čapek uh, wrote, um, uh, wrote a book uh, or published a book of conversations with uh, Masaryk, which was in every library in uh, the country, even during communist times. Okay, um, let me compare this with Hans Kelsen. And Hans Kelsen, I told you already, wrote, um, is the author of the Austrian Constitution. So around exactly the same time. And uh, he is behind the constitution of the Austrian Republican statehood in 1918 and afterwards. His theory was very, uh, uh, presented something very similar. He was always warning against hot, oh sorry, against risks of hot relativistic moralism, and he promised the icy, value-free legal science, the pure theory of law. Uh, if, if I were to grossly simplify it, and uh, I have to tread carefully here because uh, I can see in the audience some great experts uh, of, um, uh, who have uh, great knowledge of uh, Kelsen, of Patochka, and, um, uh, um, and who settled. But uh, to simplify uh, pure theory, it says no values in law, no facts in law, no cognitions, only norms. Law was to be purified of natural or social justice and separated from social and intellectual environment. And uh, this uh, thesis, he basically radicalized modern liberal separation of law and morality. Every liberal, uh, in, in the liberal tradition, in the liberal spirit of uh, legal positivism, morals, morality, is a matter of your private choice, but law is a matter of public obedience, and so the private, public, law, morality has to be strictly separated. However, Kelsen much radicalized this thesis because he wanted to separate law from politics, economy, religion, philosophy, and other external evaluations of law. Law is self-validated. Why? What is behind it? It's exactly the fear of moral fundamentalism. It's interesting because to liberals of 21st century, it sounds 
like a cynicism, but it's probably because liberals of 21st century became such strong moralists to their detriment. This is liberalism of uh, uh, post uh, First World War. And Kelsen's notion of democracy, again, I won't repeat uh, the quote here, uh, but uh, you, can, um, uh, you can read it while I'll try to briefly explain his imaginary of democracy. He says, democracy rules out moral absolutism. Moral absolutism, the absolute, Chapek's absolute, is a sign of totalitarianism. Democracy is relativistic. He's very similar, despite all uh, inspirations by Max Weber, critical inspirations by Max Weber, he, in this respect, Kelsen surprisingly sounds like Georg Zimmel. And uh, so values, and democracy is the political regime built and drawing on relativism, because nobody can claim the absolute validity of value judgments. And uh, what is important for him, they are neither logically nor morally. So relativism of values is followed in Kelsen by impossibility of reasoning for the objective common good, so-called non-cognitivism. And it's interesting that, uh, especially to philosophers, this might sound, again, odd, because we, the whole theory of justice is about reasoning for the best possible model of a just society. And here you have a lawyer constitutionalist who tells you, no, the idea that you can come to the just settlement by general reasoning is a fantasy. And he even mentions the average citizen, the average man. He says, well, this is, this is impossible. So uh, the absence of the common will is the next step. There is no common will. Democracy, in other words, is just a technique of direct or indirect participation, but for Kelsen there is something very important. It materializes both freedom and equality because, of course, you participate freely and in an equal manner. Yeah. So uh, it's a procedural technique which is there to make sure that political power is processed on the basis of freedom and equality, but it's fully legitimized by the Constitution. So one conclusion um, uh, um, by Kelsen about the state is that the state sovereignty is nonsense. It, does, it, it has to be uh, removed from thinking of lawyers because the state is a legal concept, okay? This is very important there. So law was to accept a relativistic imaginary of democracy, but at the same time, there was the basic normativity, the basic norm and norm pure normativity, which defined what you can do and you cannot do in the state. Well, let me make, uh, so this is a comparison between um, Chapek, pragmatist, and Kelsen, um, skeptical normativist. However, at the same time when um, uh, Kelsen puts together his thoughts on pure theory of law where that you can have pure science, you have another great man, great thinker, of this territory, Edmund Husserl. And Husserl, exactly at the same time, has this wonderful introduction, this paragraph, into um, his uh, crisis of European sciences and transcendental phenomenology. It's, uh, um, of course, it reminds you immediately Goethe's Faust, when he said, what he says about, um, uh, if history has nothing more to teach us than that all the shapes of the spiritual world 
All the conditions of life, ideals, norms upon which men rely, form and dissolve themselves like fleeting waves. That it always was and ever will be so. That again and again reason must turn into nonsense and well-being into misery. And uh, um, clearly, at the time when Kelsen wanted to protect objective validity of legal science, Husserl criticized, and it was almost self-criticism, or it was a critical revision of pure phenomenology, and he came as with uh, the critique of the scientific reason by adopting the concept of the life world. Shared, intersubjectively shared life world. And the question of, so what did he ask? The question of meaning behind the historical relativism. It's a profound philosophical question. I won't go into his uh, um, uh, image of um, uh, imaginary of philosophers as functionaries of the mankind, but uh, I want to show you something else. The concept of life world was very important, not just for philosophy. We know this, uh, many different philosophers using it from Heidegger um, uh, to uh, Erich Stein and others, but it profoundly influenced social theoretical and constitutional debates in the 1970s and the famous exchange of uh, uh, the famous polemics between Niklas Luhmann and Jürgen Habermas about uh, the legitimacy of modern society and the role of social theory in it. And Jürgen Habermas comes up with um, discourse ethics as a normative superstructure of the legal system. And he says, you have to, um, it's interesting how these left-wing Schmittians actually believe in politics. The more you politicize, the more legitimate society and political power becomes. And uh, discourse ethics, communicative reason is uh, here as a superstructure guaranteeing the legitimacy of the law, of politics, of power and legality. However, Luhmann is much more skeptical and uh, he says no critical reason, no theoretical knowledge can save us. Instead, he considered legal theory just the self-description and uh, he makes, uh, Luhmann makes one important detour from philosophical humanism, from sociological humanism. And um, uh, the whole the sociological theory, this whole stream that was started by Alfred Schutz, uh, um, a student of Husserl, and uh, um, then was described as hermeneutical sociology, is sometimes described as humanist sociology. However, Luhmann attacks this whole humanist tradition in social sciences by saying that the quest for truth as the meaningful and authentic life is replaced by the systemic concept of meaning. And the way he deals with Husserl is really radical. He takes uh, fifth Cartesian meditation, uh, not mediation, and um, it's... Um, uh, being in Vienna, talking about mediation. Uh, no, uh, so it's meditation, clearly. Uh, and uh, he says, uh, he, he uses this problem of consciousness as the parallel, and now he, he makes this trick, that this is the parallel self-reference, knowledge of itself. Consciousness always refers to itself. An external reference to phenomena. Those of you who know systems theory, you know that this is the basic... Um, idea of uh, the whole autopoetic systems theory that you have self-reference of the systems, normative, and external reference to the outside, to the environment by cognition. And um, this has uh, very important uh, consequences for any constitutional or legal theory that wants to um, uh, talk about constitutional imaginaries uh, or um, legitimation. Because the world cannot 
be guaranteed by transcendental reason and morality or political consensus. This is, this is very important. The idea that consensus creates legitimacy at a factual level is illusion. Okay? The idea of that the true and good coincide and legitimize a polity, that's something that can be traced back to uh, uh, Plato, is lost. Because instead of this um, identity of the true good and uh, um, uh, um, uh, is replaced uh, by functional differentiation. So for us, when we talk about constitutional imaginaries, it has one important consequence. You have to look for other imaginaries, not just consensus, but also dissent. All of a sudden, democracy is not about consensus building. Democracy is equally about consensus building as much as dissent communication. Dissenting and consenting becomes equally important and um, uh, it defines the operative possibilities and legitimation potential. It's the same like with norm in general. Norm can be breached, but its validity is not diminished by it. It is counterfactual. So um, a little bit of sociological enlightenment instead of uh, philosophical humanism. And the question consensus or dissent can be answered both. Because uh, none of them are foundations. Both of them are operations of the system. And now let me come to the um, uh, uh, final parts of my presentation. And uh, dissent is, of course, something which was heavily, heavily articulated uh, by dissidents in Central Eastern Europe as a moral concept, as a cultural concept, as an existential concept. And um, I believe that uh, we really have to go back to Patochka's heretical essays to understand what makes dissent so special in any constitutional imaginary of modern constitutional democracy or any social system. Uh, why are these essays heretical? It's a usual question, but um, it's, um, uh, if you read it, uh, it, is, it is very brave in the choice of intellectual resources. When he talks about civilization, he picks up Ernst Jünger and Teilhard de Chardin, <laughs> two very different figures. Yeah. And what is heretical is, he says that this civilization, which has peace as its founding value, the first goal, is actually deepening the state of war. Yes, there is an element of Schmittian reading of modernity. Uh, clearly, there's no question about it. Uh, but um, he says that for, uh, he's interested in what is this history? If it's not relative, as uh, uh, Kelsen says, if there is meaning behind historical relativism, something that Husserl asks, he says, what is this historicity? And he says, history is exactly this conflict between bare life, chained by fear, and life at the summit, which clearly sees the temporality and finiteness of human existence, and therefore is capable of understanding what is at stake. This is the solidarity of the shaken. And uh, when I, uh, many, many years ago, when I was completing my book on dissidence of law, this book was to argue, and I, I argued uh, in it, that the greatest um, job that dissidents did to legal theory, the greatest service was that they proved that legality is not a closed system which is always valid and it uh, needs uh, uh, validation from dissent. That this is this idea of legality as a facade of tyranny. 
something that um, uh, Havel uh, used in the power of the powerless, uh, but uh, that you can find if in uh, uh, Solzhenitsyn, is that um, the rule without law is tyrannical, arbitrary. But modernity teaches us one thing, how much tyranny you can do and exercise through law, through legality. Yeah? And this is a great lesson of the 20th century, that we know that legality doesn't legitimize, that we have to ask what legitimizes legality. Now we know that it's not just consensus, that it's also dissent, but uh, this solidarity of the shaken, uh, Patochka then takes uh, further and he recalls Socrates' uh, daemonion speaking in warnings, prohibitions, and defines this solidarity of the shaken as the capacity, capacity potentia, this potentiality to say no to the states of war in modern civilization, even um, uh, especially the civilization which turns every piece and human life into war. Finally, there is this, and um, I apologize to all experts on Socrates because this is a yeah, this is a, this is a rough uh, to say that Socrates' paradox of "I know that I know nothing" has an element of autopoiesis uh, is obviously doing. Uh, a very, very free interpretation of this uh, famous statement. But uh, if you read Patochka um, in the 1950s, he already has uh, thoughts on the solidarity of the shaken or the Socrates' daimonion. And he says, dissent involves actually transcensus. Okay? Transcensus, according to Patochka, is uh, this Socratic, uh, or Socr in, in Socrates, it's um, done by the experience of freedom without metaphysics, of the true transcendental being formulated later by Plato. In Plato, transcensus is from immanence to transcendence, and from physics to metaphysics, but in, uh, Pato in Patochka's reading of Socrates, Socrates, uh, according to him in uh, Patochka's study, Eternity and Historicity, is this negative knowledge of ignorance. And this is important now uh, for my argument. It's knowledge which is impossible to define in terms of normativity. It's knowledge which is impossible to define in terms of principles or positive values. It's knowledge negatively establishing what the true being and existence are not. So, it's almost like the precondition of any dissent. You have to be able to step aside and say what, is, what uh, be, true being and existence are not. And uh, Patochka even calls it uh, ethics of historicity operating independently of eternal truths, definite imperatives, and legislated laws. The ethics responds to Husserl questions of historical relativism, but at the same time, it teaches us that for the imaginary of democracy, it's consensus, it's dissent, but dissent expects this possibility of saying, I know that I know nothing, and rather than legislating laws, values, principles, saying what these laws, um, values, and principles are delegitimizing and delegitimized by. Um, I've been um, living in uh, <coughs> the United Kingdom for sufficiently long time to know that such an abstract uh, thesis has to be um, um, explained by a case study. Yeah? A case study coming to um, uh, the, my conclusion, is there a case study for this? Yes, there is. And one example is the Stern trial uh, in um, uh, the USSR. 
This was, um, and there is a story behind it, because um, uh, the Stern trial uh, was, um, uh, happened in the Soviet Union, and Dr. Stern um, was interrogated and blackmailed by the KGB, the secret police for the younger generation. Uh, it was the Soviet secret police uh, uh, to um, forbid his two sons emigrating to Israel and uh, when uh, Dr. Stern refused, uh, doctor, medical doctor, real doctor, and uh, uh, doctor, doctor, as Basil Fawlty would say. Um, it's uh, when, uh, when he refused to do this, subsequently there was a false evidence uh, of uh, uh, him, uh, uh, against him of taking bribes and he was sentenced to eight years of forced labor. Okay? And uh, <coughs> the documents, of course, were very hard to... Uh, the information about the trial was itself a courageous act of smuggling documents to the West. And when Michel Foucault was invited to a famous TV show to present another new book that every intellectual in France should read, instead of um, bringing a novel or uh, poetry, he brought this document. And... Uh, this document called the USSR versus Dr. Uh, Michael Stern, an ordinary trial. An ordinary trial is important here. Because what, was, what happened there was actually very extraordinary and something which proves that dissent and daemonian, yeah, this warning works together, cannot be separated. People, who, uh, witnesses for prosecution and uh, for young people in this audience, it's really almost impossible to explain when you were the witness for the prosecution under the communist uh, uh, system of justice, uh, you were basically already collaborating with uh, the state to get uh, people convicted. People, however, came and they witnessed to the opposite. Okay? So what happened in this ordinary trial was that um, uh, they came and they confirmed Dr. Stern's innocence during the court hearings. So Foucault summarized this lesson in the following words. Never forget that faced with the power the state has over bodies, there is also the resistance of individuals who know how to say no. Okay. And um, this is solidarity, not of the shaken, but it's gross on the recognition of the inhuman in humanity. And uh, uh, it has, even Foucault's microphysics of power has this negative ethical dimension. Coming to the final slide, this is a quote uh, from Foucault's very ironically um, um, uh, titled uh, book, Society Must Be Defended. Of course, there's a, a double meaning and irony. He says, power functions. Power is exercised through networks, and individuals do not simply circulate in those networks. They are in a position to both submit to and exercise this power. They are never inert or consenting targets of power. This is, this is uh, uh, Foucault's... Uh, uh, imaginary of power, that it's not something that you can agree on, that is exercised on your behalf. It's not something that you can protest against it. It is something that goes right through you. And um, for us, uh, this is particularly important that uh, we don't have the possibility of full legitimacy by the imaginary of democracy as consensus. The imaginary of dissent in democracy has also limited validity, but it's not a problem. This is, this is absolutely fine. If, and uh, transensus is another element which recognizes that power, this societal power, potentia, is always with us, in us, and uh, it, is, uh, it functions through us. Why is it important for today it's exactly because the old imaginary of the constitutional nation-state is insufficient in 
Europeanized and globalized society. Uh, by, if I say insufficient, I do not uh, mean to say it's unimportant. Of course it's very important. And we can see the current uh, state of Europe as uh, struggling with imaginaries of parliamentary sovereignty, state sovereignty. But at the same time, if, as a constitutional theorist, you want to understand how law functions in society today, you have to move beyond the imaginary of the statehood. You have to understand even European law as a kind of so a constitutional order. You have to understand global constitutionalizations in economic, lex mercatoria, human rights, environmental rules, as kinds of constitution making for which the ideals of cosmopolitanism are maybe beautiful ideals, but they cannot explain how it functions. Yeah? Um, the general principle, however, uh, from Roman law, if I may to use this, quote, omnes tangit becomes the basic political norm of global society, which means that those who, all those who are affected should have a say in it. Not necessarily in consensus building or through protest and dissent, but also certainly through some ethics which Patochka described as ethics of complexity, something that Husserl was calling for in the 1930s, and that today we can, ask, uh, we can call with Sloterdijk uh, the ethics of complexity which avoids the furor metaphysicus. This fury of metaphysics, uh, uh, furies of Chapex absolutes, uh, which nevertheless has potential, potentia, to authorize and legitimize mm -hmm. global power structures by ironies of societal polyvalence beyond moral values and legal norms. I, again, I have to explain this uh, at a, uh, by an example which uh, I, didn't, uh, um, I, I didn't list uh, on my slides. I think one of the greatest risks for the current um, even political liberal discourse is that it became so much moralistic that today, when I used uh, the example of Kelsen in the 1920s, he was very much opposed to moralism in uh, politics because he knew that moralism can be explosive. And moralism in the um, uh, 20s was uh, really fundamentalism. And if you read even a uh, futurist manifesto by Marinetti, of course it is anti-moralist, anti-feminist, anti-university. It wants to break up, but um, uh, because moralism was the sign of tradition. It's interesting how defenders of constitutional liberal orders have become moralistic in a very similar manner to conservatism of early 20th century in uh, constitutional science and in, in constitutional practice. So my conclusion would be if uh, constitution making at political level can be sustained, can uh, evolve, it has to evolve not as an adherence to certain principles, but as an irony and polyvalence. Thank you very much for your patience. So thank you, Yerji, for this uh, um, inspiring talk and for this very, very many references, scholarly references, uh, I think the abundant scholarly references. Uh, I'm sure there's... Um, a lot of uh, specific questions later on. Let me just start with something to also give some time to you. Uh, uh, with somehow addressing like the, the general message or the general setup of your talk. 
if I would put it into a very short sentence, the title for the talk is Legality is not a closed system. Maybe this is, maybe this is the main message. And there are subdivisions of this one message. Legality is not a closed system. You counter the, what you call at the very end the fora metaphysicus. This is one um, aspect of it, very obviously. It is anti-moralistic. Uh, you said liberalists have become moralists, and that is, you didn't say that, but I add this is a tragedy, you would say, maybe. <laughs> um, and ta taking all of this is, I think we, we have a very like clear setup of the talk. What I'm a bit more struggling with is what I said in the very beginning when I introduced you said, you, your book that you wrote, your recent book, is also a very much a critique of political existentialism. But all of what you presented to us now, I think, is very much in the line of political existentialism, right? Where would you, where would you draw the line here? Uh, you're anti-Schmittian, but then you quote Patochka, not only Patochka, but you quote Socrates. Uh, I mean, this is a very existentialist approach. One could also, in terms of speaking about uh, politics, one could also bring in one thinker that you did not mention. I would also say the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire or Central Europe is not a closed system. <laughs> I mean, you had very many references as well, to be fair, but just um, to, do, to have reference outside Hannah Arendt, uh, which is not, was not present in the talk. I mean, she is the one to stress the fluidity uh, of power in the very beginning, you said uh, the constitutionalism, this is the process of how, uh, how power turns into authority. So this process of setting up power, this fluidity of it, I think she is the, the preeminent thinker of that. Uh, this is, however, in H Hannah Arendt and in very many of the references that you made, it is a very existential, existentialized approach. So where would you draw the line? What is, what is your point of view here? Okay, um, you're absolutely right uh, and uh, precise in your critical comments. Uh, I have six uh, and then I stopped uh, because it would be... Um, uh, um, legality is not a closed system. Um, yes, legality... There is a traditional question. The question is, can you bridge the gap between functionality of law and the meaning of law? Instrumental and symbolic uh, rationality. And Weber goes, <laughs> that's interesting what you say uh, about existentialism, because this is exactly how um, Raymond Aron um, uh, describes uh, Max Weber, uh, Wilfredo Pareto, and um, Emil Durkheim, that they were all existentialists in philosophical terms. Yeah. And uh, um, Max Weber says, well, this is impossible, because everything works, iron cage of modernity, everything works uh, despite the loss of meaning. And maybe there is this, this really existentialist uh, sight uh, by Weber who says maybe the future belongs um, uh, to the experts without heart. Yeah? And, but this, the, this expertise goes beyond existentialism. Maybe this is existence, but this is functionality and this is, this is not, this is systemic rationality. So legality is a closed system when it comes to functionality, but the functionality of law is not conditioned purely by legal norms. So what comes from outside can be qualified, and I would say my critique of political existentialism is um, a critique of the belief in some concrete, specific forces that make constitutions and states happen, like the nation, like the people. Because when you say the nation, when you say the people, you are already making a step from existentialist uh, or existential description to the imaginary. 
Okay? So these categories are already imaginaries and we should work with them, we should analyze them as imaginaries, uh, constitutional imaginaries, and therefore it's not uh, exist, uh, philosophical existentialism, it's uh, um, sociological semantics for me. Uh, in terms of method, uh, tragedy of moralism, you're absolutely right uh, on tragedy of moralism and uh, this, is, this is what I can see right now in Britain, uh, what uh, I can see in Czech Republic. It's interesting how the society is split and one half calls the other almost less of a human. You, uh, if, you, if you vote for Czech president, you must be by definition an idiot, or um, if you vote for Brexit, you must be by definition xenophobic racist, or if you vote uh, uh, for um, um, liberal party, you are that cosmopolitan, uh, um, um, yeah, that uh, conceited intellectual, or as we have the saying in Czechia, uh, yeah, sluníčkáři, people who uh, uh, feel like uh, sunshine belongs to them. <laughs> and uh, op, the Prague Café is called, yeah, that uh, you, you must be coming from the Prague Café. So it's, uh, um, and uh, moralism in politics is always dangerous. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying that uh, with uh, full knowledge of risking too much when it comes to contemporary legal theory, because today legal theory is not positivistic, today the vast majority of legal and constitutional theory is based on the belief in the common objective good. Yeah? And um, <sighs> Arendt, absolutely. Yeah, Arendt is uh, so fascinating. I even started my academic career by translating Arendt's on violence and his, uh, con uh, 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 th th this contrast between violence and power, which is in on violence, that violence diminishes power. It's so fascinating. It's like written by Max Weber. So who wants to be first? Um, maybe we start in the back. I ask you, you mentioned violence, and uh, uh, Hans Kelsen uh, wrote something about revenge also, quite a huge essay, a brilliant one. Um, I would say you split a little bit in your talk, Kelsen, in a way, yeah? and I would like to know, because he, was a, he had a great style also in his writing, and you are also very keen on this kind of aspects of art and literature, and do you see, as far as I remember, there is only Norberto Bobbio, uh, at his range, in this kind of capacity also to reflect every aspect of societies. Um, my banal question is why these people are dying out, basically, the first question. And then the second is, Kelsen and Bobbio, they were very moralistic in their attitude at the end of the day. As, as well as somebody like a, pra a practitioner as Carla del Ponte, no? because you have to be quite rigid in a way. Could you could you say something about this? So the yeah, Kelsen oh. style for for you as a as a as a yeah as a scholar, and then the, the question of moralistic attitude. Yeah. Uh, shall I respond immediately? Kelsen style absolutely mm -hmm. astonishing, and certainly much better than his uh, skills to drive a car apparently, because uh, I, when I was in Berkeley, uh, there was a very old um, uh, retired professor who um, after the seminar said, well, I remember Kelsen as a young student. We always had to park his car. He was completely useless. Yeah? And, uh, and you know that Kelsen in California, he, uh, he was teaching at uh, a political science faculty, not the law faculty. And it's fascinating that Kelsen has, uh, s uh, like, like every great thinker, there are contradictions uh, in his uh, uh, theories. There is a development in his theory and he radically, especially his late essays uh, in the, written in the um, uh, 60s and 70s, he radically revised his notion of pure uh, theory of law 
and uh, he, uh, he, uh, he was very critical of positivism. This is what he had uh, in common with Bobbio, because Bobbio uh, referred to ideological positivism. And you're absolutely right that uh, both uh, these great uh, legal and political thinkers uh, had very strong political convictions. And they had uh, very strong political views. And uh, uh, just over lunch, uh, I was trying to explain Kelsen's position to um, my colleagues here. And uh, I tried to say how he was a social democrat, he was very a republican, very much committed uh, to the democratic constitutional state building, and at the same time he believed that this is something that um, uh, you, you cannot fully justify by reason, that you cannot legitimized by um, morality, because both reason and morality are actually too weak. So pure normativity for him was like going back to Kant and revisit Kant and freedom as the law. Yeah? And I know that uh, I'm, uh, I'm now um, simplifying a very um, uh, complicated and complex aspect of Kelsen's theory, but uh, I just want to illustrate that uh, his pure theory of law doesn't uh, rule out the possibility of uh, strong um, uh, um, ideals and commitment to democracy, rule of law, and uh, freedoms and liberties. Yeah, uh, yeah probably enough. Thank you, Yuri, for incredibly rich talk. I probably didn't understand much of it, so I hope to, for a chance to, to ask you later in more detail. But now maybe to continue with Ludger's offensive, I wonder, I mean, you talk about moralism, but of course, critique of moralism is the centerpiece of Schmidt's whole attack on liberalism, right? It's, it's as old as, as Schmidt and probably older. And, and the problem for Schmidt is, is, is actually precisely the attempt to formulate constitutional principles that are universal and especially human rights, right? And so that quote from Patochka, how, how uh, a politics of humanity has led to incredible dehumanization is of course a straight, straight borrowing from the concept of the political. So I'm wondering how does your critique of moralism differ from Schmidt or are you actually on this line or on this point in full agreement? Um, that's question one. The second I'm really, because I want to defend the concept of the people, I'm really interested in your critique of it and understanding it fully. So I don't understand what's the difference between cons constitutional imaginary and sociological semantic. I mean, where does the constitutional imaginary come from? And if I think in different categories, and those taken, let's say, from French liberalism, Montesquieu uh, and Tocqueville, so the key distinction there is between laws and mores. And the suggestion is that laws can only hold, they only can have authority if they're grounded in mores, so in these sociological semantics in whatever, whatever you call it. So I wonder how you take take that. And last question, sorry to be so voluminous, but it's, it's your fault. <laughs> I'm just one <laughs> I'm wondering um, about the psychology of dissent. Why should one dissent, especially in the Soviet Union where that could mean terrible uh, consequences, right? Isn't it because one ultimately believes or holds on to a notion of truth and justice? Can we even understand the phenomenon of dissent without that? Mm -hmm. that was at Three questions, maybe more. <laughs> so uh, you should answer right away. Okay. Um, critique of moralism. Uh, I even, some years ago, I even uh, wrote uh, an article in which I tried to compare Kelsen and Schmidt from the perspective of uh, systems theory, that you can read um, uh, both through lens of uh, autopoetic systems theory. And obviously, Carl Schmitt uh, was a great thinker, 
and uh, those caricatures uh, that make him a Nazi uh, ideologue or that make him a critique of liberalism, uh, they, they really uh, reduce the complexity of his thinking. And he had a very, very good sense of the crisis of modernity. What is critical in modernity? And, um, uh, but the, the problem with uh, Schmidt's concept of political is that when you, read it, uh, when you read it as a lawyer, you immediately spot one weak point. That the state of exception and that sovereignty is not in parliament, it's not in the people, it is shifted to the power of the executive. And this is a big problem with Schmidt's uh, uh, legal or constitutional theory, that he relies on the executive power. Yeah? And uh, rather than uh, uh, this uh, abstraction of uh, sovereignty, popular sovereignty or parliamentary sovereignty, he goes straight uh, for the will, for the volume. Yeah? And uh, there, is a, uh, there is a very dangerous asymmetry when he's very critical, and I agree with his uh, critique of uh, moralism or administrative state, another depoliticization through administrative rationalization, a great topic uh, for European uh, law and European politics in particular. But um, there is an asymmetry. He says, while you cannot, while you shouldn't depoliticize politics, you can politicize everything <laughs> by this distinction. So this, this is my problem with uh, Schmidt, this asymmetry. Uh, I hope I un uh, answered the concept of the people, I, oh, constitutional imagery and sociological um, uh, semantics. Sociological semantics uh, is uh, the method uh, through which you examine, compare, and analyze uh, constitutional imaginaries. So the meaning of particular images and what makes, um, um, uh, for instance, constitution meaningful and what precedes its functionality. Um, uh, finally, uh, if you want to ask, yeah, the, you mentioned this, uh, Mores and laws growing out of Mores, uh, uh, the liberal thought would be exactly the opposite, split it, because modernity by definition means plurality, so the commonality can be uh, guaranteed only by legality rather than uh, by mores. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's probably not even for another lecture, it's for, uh, for the whole semester. Uh, and, um, okay, yeah. Thank you, <coughs> thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, somehow connect to this third question. Uh, I really uh, would like to ask, um, uh, does uh, dissent in your using uh, or in your use means uh, something similar or even close to the word, uh, word social critic? And the second question would be uh, how is a dissent uh, in a society created or produced? It is something automatic. And then the third question I would like uh, if you can somehow explain because we know that in it doesn't have to be just uh, uh, in Soviet society. In, uh, in every society, there is something like uh, conformism yeah, and reification uh, with some norms and so on. How would you explain uh, such a different reaction in the Czech part of, of the former Czechoslovakia on this uh, uh, of this uh, normalization after the invasion, and in uh, in the Slovak part of Czechoslovakia, where? Uh, we can uh, hardly find any kind of, of, of dissent, just few person in general. Okay, so, uh, and then um, the second, uh, this was like one question, <laughs> but the second would be, uh, would you really uh, have some non-empirical reasons to, to convince uh, a democratic s community, a national state to, to open the borders? It is not only something just uh, we we believe it should be from some moral, but do you have some? S s I don't know if if there are, it is it, if there if those are philosophical reasons probably not, but something other than empirical reason like environment or migrants or something like that, uh, global economics and something like that. Thank you very much. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I, I will try to be brief. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, this is what you wanted uh, uh, because I didn't answer uh, Eva's most important question, which always I dread that um, I will. Uh, I always dread that I will not um, uh, fully respond to the questions, and I, I fail to respond to your most important question, which was fortunately picked up uh, by you which is um, uh, what, uh, what makes uh, the, the psychology of dissent, yeah? what makes people to dissent, whether there is some question of justice, whether there is uh, so some belief, you said belief. Yeah? Uh, I would put it um, uh, maybe more modestly, you don't have to believe, but uh, you, you have to be in disbelief that what's going on around you is actually happening. Yeah? And sometimes simply body revolts rather than the mind, yeah? and um, uh, so dissent uh, doesn't have to be a question of justice as an idea, but rather in, in this negative sense, revulsion at injustices, and just injustices can be many, and uh, therefore uh, dissent, um, uh, is it something automatic? It's not automatic. Uh, it's, it's, um, and I completely left out one part uh, of, uh, or one, uh, uh, yeah, one aspect uh, of uh, this whole problem, which is um, uh, normalization. <laughs> because normalization is a very important, crucial concept which depicts Czechoslovakia of the 70s. But at the same time, it was used in France in the 70s. After the rowdy 60s, we have now normal 70s. Yeah? And if you look at culture, um, uh, even culture in the West was pretty rubbish, a disco. And then you needed a punk revolt uh, to revolt against the 70s. Yeah? So, nor uh, and this is uh, why am I talking about France in particular, because this is the time when uh, Michel Foucault goes into analytics or microphysics of power, when he analyzes what makes society normal, normalization. And he, has, he is scathing about law. He says, legality belongs to the absolute monarchy. Uh, modernity is the ascendancy of social norm at the expense of the law. Yeah. And, um, to dissent, therefore, means less dissenting against legality, against law, and more against what is described as normality. So dissent is um, um, targeting normality, normalization, and it may uh, partly explain, and now I'm, uh, I'm just thinking aloud, uh, uh, that uh, the difference between normal um, uh, uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia, because Slovakia in the 70s was much less uh, normalized and it had even some elements of uh, materialization of national aspirations because the state became federal and um, uh, standard of living was uh, um, uh, growing faster than in Czech Republic, uh, than in Czech lands. And um, uh, we have to remember dissidents were very, very small group of people, usually former, uh, um, either from uh, former 68ers or uh, cultural elite and uh, intellectuals, but uh, uh, where would you look for them? Obviously, always in the capital. <laughs> And so uh, I hope this explains uh, at least to some extent or responds uh, to your question. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jerzy. Um, difference between Slovakia and Czech Republic. Um, now it will become uh, embodied, incorporated <laughs> for the last two questions that we are having. First with Samuel Abram uh, from Bisla College in Bratislava, the Stovak question. And then, Jerzy, I have bad news for you. For you then your nightmare will come true. Yesterday you said in the presence of Ivan Hwatik you should not even mention the name Patochka, but uh, you did, <laughs> so now you have to. 
you don't want you have no 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 the whole setup is is you you wanted to have a question even <laughs> no come on let's let's have these two final questions please Samuel you start <laughs> I will not talk about the difference between normalization in Czech Republic and Slovakia because it's my master thesis and I will be too long and then I I would disagree in this but but that would be too long but what I what I, um, it was, it might be a minor point, but it could be something when you either quoted Kelsen or, or basically it's also your position that, that what is needed is pure nor uh, normativity and the, because reason and morality is weak. And I said, well, what is strong is the furor, but not furor metaphysics, but the rage that Sloterdijk uh, writes about. So convincingly and often very funny, that is part of human nature. And how do you bind uh, the rage? Uh, by creating law, norms, uh, morality. Now, I wonder how that debate differentiates what we read uh, in, in, in Hegel in, in, uh, in, and, of course, in Nietzsche, uh, the, the, the slave and the master um, the relationship where slave has to invent something in his trepidation to, 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 to hold the master so, so the, the, the Ubermensch doesn't do what he wants. Uh, what else than laws? But how, what else than laws based on morality? Perhaps not ethics, because ethics is too Greek, but morality. Uh, to, to, for Nietzsche, of course, a false thing, but for us, the only thing that we can relay, rely when, when Mr. Stern faces, or, or Comrade Stern faces Stalin trials. So, so it, it might, be, might not be a proper question, because you might agree with me, but, but perhaps uh, you as a legal expert, you, 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 you somehow cannot allow morality to enter your field, and I'm happy with that because I think that this Havel's over morality is actually destroying uh, intellectuals in our lands because they look down upon everyone. They smear at least everyone. Everybody is nobody because they are not high in the clouds and they are marginalized but righteous. But <clears throat> if you could respond to that, please. Uh, perhaps uh, rather similar uh, when uh, you well, I'm no expert on on Kelsen and uh, when when you characterized uh, the basic uh, basic concept of, of his uh, of his uh, constitutional legality uh, I, I don't understand how uh, is it possible to to to, uh, to keep uh, Every notion of value uh, and and uh, and uh, morality uh, outside from, from, from law, because perhaps, uh, uh, as I understand, what is law, it it, it it is perhaps exactly what you what you said. It's a formulation of the common objective good, because what else could be could be law. Thank you very much, and uh, it's almost like back to the beginning because uh, uh, when you say rage or revenge was mentioned here, yeah? and it's interesting because it, it really brings us to uh, this. Uh, we can we can even ask was uh, Thomas Hobbes the first political existentialist, <laughs> and uh, what is what is defining. Um, uh, the state of civility from uh, the natural state. Yeah? And uh, uh, this would be the difference between rage or revenge and the law, legality in the political state. And of course, at what is the cost? You can do it only by granting uh, sovereignty over life. Uh, and uh, um, this is how you create the Leviathan. Um, so uh, when it uh, comes to norm or law and morality, um, you're absolutely right. Every lawyer will be trying to separate uh, 
law from ethics. Yeah? Ethics is something yeah, that's how you should live good life. Yeah? But uh, don't mess it up with uh, uh, general legality, how we organize uh, uh, the common space. And uh, at the same time, we, however, uh, know that especially today, the, whole, the last 70 years in constitutional theory is uh, basically illustrated by attempts to square this circle. It's almost like Brexit. Yeah? It's, you try to find the solution for something which is incompatible. Yeah? That uh, you try to say that the law is sovereign, but at the same time what is sovereign in law is not legality. It's legal principles, so then we, we say that we believe in positive law, but positive law is based on suprapositive yeah, principles, which can be interpreted. But who interprets them? Lawyers, judges. So somebody who is within the realm of positive law. So this justice then becomes a formula, or what you were asking about, so what is it that then... Uh, pins down the legality, and uh, is there something more? Yes, so everybody talks about justice and suprapositive principles, but these principles change. When, when judges, constitutional judges, judges of the Supreme Court, talk about founding values, you can be sure that sooner or later these values will be transvalued. So values, constitutional values, are always waiting lists. I know it sounds relativistic, if not even cynical, but this is how it operates in law. So the idea of justice then becomes uh, almost like a contingency formula. I don't have the text, so I have to go beyond it. And uh, this, uh, th th this goes back to Kelsen and his, is there something that is common to law and morality? And he would say, yes, it's the pure normativity the basic norm which is in legality, you can go further and you can find that morality and law share this pure normativity as transcendental logical precondition of both law and morality. So for, yeah, this is, uh, but, uh, but don't ask him about the content. Yeah, it's, it's a sheer transcendental logical precondition of any positive law and any positive morality. So this is, this is really this uh, uh, Kantian element in, um, in uh, Kelsen. That's why he criticized positivism, because he said, well, positivists are always after content, I'm after, uh, I'm after normativity. And uh, Luhmann would tell him, no, we should be after just uh, um, uh, general operations of uh, meaning. Thank you, Yeji. Let me finish on a very short note. Um, we are in very good relation with the Czech Embassy in, in Vienna. And uh, I'm very sure today for your talk, Yeji, one of them would have been here, maybe the ambassador himself. But they excuse themselves because they have a high-ranking politician of the Czech Republic as a guest, in fact, the highest ranking. So um, I, I think this is pride, quite understandable that they are not here tonight. But uh, not having this kind of ambassador, we had another ambassador, and that was you, Jerzy, uh, uh, also a very nice ambassador of the Czech Republic, and also to make it a bit more interesting, a bit also an ambassador of Wales. It was We didn't go very much into this, but all of you who have spoken to him over lunch know about his ambitions of being an ambassador of both these countries, I guess. So thank you again for your uh, talk tonight. And uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, welcome back hopefully someday. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. And uh, uh, yeah, I hope to be back yeah, soon. Thank you. <laughs>